right, let's take a couple of more steps. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the tests themselves, just um, basically to say that with a second edition, I expanded the test out to include different versions. So we have the traditional eight subtest or 12 subtest versions of the CAS, but we added the Spanish CAS. We have a brief version, which is very good as a screening tool, or when you just need 20 minutes, you want to get a quick look at a kid, find out what's going on, um, and then the rating scales. So these are the various options based upon, you know, you could think of it as where you are in tier one, tier two, tier three, or what kind of needs you have. Um, but that's, that's what the tests are designed. They're designed to be um, used in a number of different contexts by a number of different people. A lot of special ed and teachers are using the CAS2 brief and the rating scale respectively. A lot of psychs are using the rating scale um, as a follow-up or a screener. We are working on a digital CAS. It's actually um, just about done. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we do have online scoring and report writing. So you really don't have to do, you know, put the raw scores in and you get your report. You can copy and paste and do whatever you want with it. It's an unlimited use. Um, it's really, it really works well. Um, the CAS2 brief, all the scores are mean of 100 and SDF 15, only four subtests as it should be. The, the actual directions are on the record form. Um, and the CAS2 rating scale is pretty straightforward. Uh, CAS2, Espanol, as I mentioned, you can get a lot more information on all these tools um, and how to use them and um, chapters on administration, scoring, all the details of all the jazz, you know, that comes with this in my, in the book that Tulio and I uh, wrote, Essentials of uh, CAS2 Assessments. So I, I encourage you to uh, take a look at that. We really need to talk about um, this thinking and knowing a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to, I, I want to show you a case I think illustrates it really well. So this is a case that Tulio brought um, to my attention about a year or so ago. That's not really the boy's picture, but I always like to have a picture when I talk about it, the case. Uh, Alejandro, having difficulty in school, teacher, Wondering, is it attention deficit? Uh, you know, he's kind of not really cooperative, on and on and on. So Tulio gives achievement test and the WISC, and look what he found. Scores between the 70s and 80s on both tests. Now, it is very reasonable to say this young man is doing the best he can. That's very reasonable if you believe the WISC measures all that should be measured. But look at the CAS scores. Planning of 102, very average. Simultaneous, 96, very average. Successive, kind of on the borderline, 84, right? About 15th percentile. Attention. 67, inattentive type of ADHD. The, the discussion in the meeting with, the, with the, you know, the, all the staff at the eligibility was, is he intellectually disabled or not? Answer is no. But the different test changes your child, the view of the same child in a very dramatic way. Think of the difference how you would feel about this was your own child. Your expectations would be different. You'd be pretty confused, really, in a lot of ways, because you'd probably be saying, you know, I don't really know that he seems like he's more capable, but his achievement scores don't show that. All these, we, in, our, in the Essentials book, we have tons of cases. They're all real. We don't have to change any numbers to make it look good or pick just the right kids to make a point. We, we have case after case after case like this. 
This is what happens when you really change your view. When you really understand what you have and you really understand what you could have. And I just want to point out one more thing. They're going to move ahead here. Notice that full scale score is crossed out. Because the full scale score doesn't matter. What matters is these individual scores. CAS is really, a, is really four tests in one. I mean, that's really what it is. It's really about measuring four separate abilities. So what we really have with Alejandro is a learning disability. And in my, in my discrepancy consistency method, what we do is we illustrate his pattern of strengths and weaknesses in a triangle. I started doing this in 1997. Other people have adopted my triangle. Um, but here's, here's why it's important. You have significant differences among the pass scores. In other words, he's not equally capable across the four basic psychological processes. He's got strengths in simultaneous and planning, weaknesses in attention and success. He's got significant discrepancy between good cognition and bad academics. That's a traditional achieve, uh, ability achievement discrepancy. But his consistency answers the question, why does he fail? It's not a coincidence. His low attention scores and success of, is what's driving these academic failure. And unless you answer that question, why he fails, you don't know what to do with him. And Tulio has just shown me another case recently where the intervention was simply they explained to the student about the need to really pay attention carefully when struggling. They used um, a, a graphic from my Helping Children Learn book, which is a little graphic that says, think smart, look at the details. They put that, scotch tape that to the kid's desk. And the, the teacher reported a few, like a week later, how much better the student was doing. Simple little intervention had a real powerful impact. So, if you really understand what's wrong, you'll be more able to help students. And remember this, the first step should be tell the student what you found. You don't need to worry about the student not understanding because you can explain it in kid word, kid language. It's not hard. What happens when you do that? All of a sudden the kid says, yeah, that's right. I just can't concentrate. And you say, I know, but I know how to help you. Think smart, look at the details. Think smart, use a plan. Use your good planning. Use your front part of your brain. And you explain the brain to kids. They can get it. You want to bring the kids into the solution. Once you've done that, that's, that's a life-changing event. Because if you tell the teacher, your kid has a different teacher next year, then who knows if they're going to read your report in two years later. But when you help a student understand his or her own strengths and weaknesses, that, uh, that makes a bigger difference. So that's really the key. So you intentionally teach the student, talk to them about their brain, Talk to them about using sequences. Use my Helping Children Learn book. There's lots and lots of strategies in there, and that'll make a big difference. Little research update. You know, I know we have Saturday Night Live update, but this is just, <laughs> this is just a G update and a couple other things. Um, now, um, I want to talk about equity for a moment. And I encourage you to take a look at the standards for our educational and psychological assessment, the AERA, APA. Um, when I was on the Committee for Psychological Tests and Assessment, we talked a lot about this issue of test bias versus equitable assessment. Test bias usually described in, as psychometric bias. 
And lots of times people will say, oh, we've taken all of the test bias out of our test. But they don't talk about the equitable assessment piece. And I'm thinking of explicit people, actually, when I say that. But here's what this standard says. If a person has had limited opportunities to learn the content in a test of intelligence, that test may be considered unfair because it penalizes students for not knowing the answers even if the norming data do not demonstrate test bias. So in other words, when you read in a test manual, oh, we study test bias and we don't have any differential item functioning, we have similar um, factor structure, um, blah, 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 item gradients and so on and so forth, but they don't ever talk about the, the impact, meaning mean score differences, and not really covering the whole issue. Because that's what really impacts kids the most. And that's why I want to show you this, this um, summary of data, also from my Essentials book. I pulled together all that we know about these different tests. They're all, all the details about where I got these data are in the footnote or and in my book. The only studies that I did were the CAS and the KBC. All the others were done by other people, but, and they have different methodologies. Sometimes they're matched samples. Sometimes they're just normative sample, which represents the US population. Sometimes they're statistical controls. Well, if you see all the traditional tests, where they are, and then you come down, you look at the KBC, um, the KBC normative sample, the KBC match. This was my study. I published this study in 1985. I was the only person to do a study on the black-white study on the KBC. The KBC2 match samples, um, the CAS2, CAS, and CAS2. And you can see, once you move away from traditional IQ, the difference between blacks and whites goes down considerably. That's really important. I'll tell you a little bit more. We can do better. Here's what you get for Hispanics. Basically the same difference. Hispanic and non-Hispanic differences on pass in the cognitive assessment system. Basically the same, 4.8. Um, interestingly, when you give the CAS in English or Spanish, you get the same results. Not only do you get the same results in terms of mean scores, you get the same decisions. Over 90% of the time, your decision about whether the student had a strength or a weakness in PASS is the same. That's because we're measuring thinking, not knowing. And we replicated that study, got the same results. All these studies are on my website. You can go and read them. I'll just tell you, there's a really interesting court case um, in Elgin, Illinois. It had to do with gifted, and I do a lot of work with fair assessment of gifted kids. I'm actually going to publish three tests for gifted um, next year. And um, it, in this particular court case, the judge, uh, well, to give you a little bit of background, the district is 42, 46%, uh, 42 percent Hispanics, only 2 percent of gifted kids were Hispanic. Something's wrong, right? So what the judge determined was that the district intentionally discriminated against Hispanic students by placing too much emphasis on verbal and math test scores to get into a gifted program. Even though they gave my Nagliari nonverbal, basically they ignored it. So a student with a really high score on a nonverbal test couldn't get in because they didn't have high verbal score. This test has a lot of implications for us. this court case has a lot of implications for us because we do this all the time when you give traditional IQ tests and I think it's just plain wrong. Um, in this particular paper that I published in the Journal of Mental Retardation 2001, 20, 20 years ago, we showed how in fact you're more likely to put a black kid in a class for intellectual disabled if they were given a whisk 
than if they're given a CAS. Because the WIS scores have lower VI verbal scales, which bring down the full scale, which gets the kids in that, in that um, designation. This is a social justice issue that we've been talking about the whole day. Now, interestingly in California, there was a legal uh, opinion rendered, um, and this is the legal opinion that the CAS, because it doesn't rely on knowledge, and it's not an IQ test really, that it was acceptable for assessment of children um, in California. So again, you can read this on my website, read all the details. Um, now, what about G? There's a lot of research out there that says all of these tests, like the WISC, the WJ, Stanford Binet, and so on, should only be interpreted at the full scale level because the amount of variance that is accounted for by the scales is not sufficient to be interpreted. Said in plain English, this research says the only score you, can, you should interpret on, for example, a Stanford Binet, a Woodcock Cognitive, or a WISC is the full scale, the total score, because the parts really don't, they don't uh, have specific variants. This is just a list of some of the research that these guys have done. This is controversial, controversial because a lot of people who, who have been advocating for interpretation of scales on all these different tests don't like it. But there's a lot of research here that says a lot of consistency that you should only be interpreting the full scale, except for you know what test? Mine. The same author, Gary Canavay, who's done all these other studies, found that compared to the WISC, the WACE, the Stanford Binet, and so on and so on and so forth, the, the CAS scales do have enough variance to be interpreted. And if you think about it, I mean, this is a really important finding. And I, I've known Gary for a long time, and I actually gave him my standardization sample data. I trusted him to tell me what was. I, I'm like, Gary, just tell me what you find. Whatever it is, I'm going to live with it. But I want to know. And this is what he said. So I encourage you to take a look at that paper. It doesn't mean that there's not, there's not some higher order, but that there's also the lower order. So take a look at the paper. Um, now, if in fact we're going to interpret scales, the next really important question is, is there evidence that there are actually profiles on PASS? And do those profiles make sense? And do past scores really relate to achievement? So more research is needed. Well, let me show you what I've found. In a couple of different book chapters, I've summarized again. I go to all the resources, find the research, summarize it. That's all I'm doing here. And in this slide, it's, there's a lot of information here, but here's what I did. These are the one, two, three, four, five studies that have been done on children with reading decoding failure. These are the dyslexic children. Dyslexic children are the ones with a reading decoding failure. On the WISC, they're above 85 on everything, a little low on working memory, but WISC 5, WISC 4, pretty much similar pattern. On the WJ, you get this, everything is 90 or above. KBC, everything's flat. But look at the CAS. The student who can't do reading decoding can't do phonological tasks, can't do those things because the success of processing is so low. 
the successive processing that's the weakness. That's the disorder in basic psychological processing that's manifested in poor reading decoding and related skills like spelling and so on and so forth. Remembering things in order, speech articulation, handwriting, tying your shoes, remembering the combination to your locker, all that kind of stuff. Now, these data are really important, but it's not enough. What other group do we often have difficulty differentiating from LD kids, specific uh, SLD kids, ADHD. So what do children with ADHD look like? That's the next set of data. So children with ADHD on the WISC-5 and the WISC-4, everything's good. In other words, the WISC-5 and the WISC-4 doesn't reveal any cognitive explanation for the behaviors related to ADHD. Neither does the WJ, neither does the KBC, the CAS sure does. Now, you might say, well, ADHD, isn't that a failure of attention? Well, not really, because ADHD is about, as Russell Barkley talks about it, is about failure of executive function, a frontal lobe disorder. The inattentive type is failure in attention, but the typical ADHD student that student with ADHD is struggling because they're poor in planning, and we've had this found this in several of our studies. The good news is you can really help them. I'm going to show you that's going to be the last couple of slides. I'm going to show you my research, how you can actually help students with ADHD and LD do better in academics and on standardized achievement tests and generalized to over time. We'll get there. But this is a lot of information right here. These profiles are really, really important. And they tell us that students vary on profiles on the CAS. The profiles really don't vary very much from other tests. Now, the only thing that kind of comes out is working memory on the WISC for kids with reading to coding failure. But remember, part of the working memory scale is digits forward. And digits forwards is successive processing. So there's a little bit of a, I mean, it's not a very clean measurement, but it's a little bit there. Look at the WJ. You know, this is CHC. This is really troubling because basically it's not differentiating these kids at all. And these are data that come right out of the WJ manual. KBC is also troubling. I wish the KBC worked, but I'm not seeing any evidence of it. And look at how different the profiles are on the CAS. There's a lot of other really good research on profiles. And I encourage you to take a look at these. Um, the one that looked at profiles for the entire standardization sample, especially important. Mine, we looked at relationship between profiles and whether or not you wound up in special ed. Not find out if you had a significant profile on the past theory, you're more likely to have been previously identified as needing special ed. That was pretty crazy. And um, a lot of other different kinds of profiles, different kind of profiles for different kinds of children, like the study that Judy Johnson did, looking at students with written expression disabilities, finding there are different kinds of patterns. These patterns matter. PAS has these scores matter. Now, when I looked at all these profiles, I thought, wow, this is crazy. There's a lot of variability that's going on there. I wonder how well the past scores really correlate with achievement. Because, you know, that's kind of like a basic validity question. In fact, you know, uh, I have to tell you, when I first started publishing my research on, on uh, black-white differences, for example, some people said, well, you don't get 
the differences that other people find because your test is less valid. Um, that really irritated me. Um, but uh, perhaps the most compelling evidence of validity is correlation to achievement. But I have a problem if I want to do a research study in that area because if I want to compare the risk correlation to achievement or the Stanford Binet to achievement or the WJ to achievement and the CAS to achievement, well, all those other tests have achievement in them. Vocabulary information, arithmetic, I don't have that in the CAS. So I have a disadvantage. But I did it, I did the research anyway. And let me show you what I found. Really interestingly, in this, again, summarized in my Essentials book with Tulio, um, when you look at the WISC 5, the WJ cognitive, of the KBC, the CAS always correlates higher than any of these tests with achievement. And it doesn't have achievement in it. So it's definitely more valid as a predictor of academic achievement. But then more recently, a meta-analysis was just published. And this meta-analysis, um, just published in the Journal of Intelligence by George Giorgio, he showed clearly that the correlations between these 60-something studies, that the correlations were significantly stronger than correlations reported in previous meta-analyses for all other measures of intelligence. So my collection of research and this meta-analyses of all the research, because there's a lot of research on the past theory out there, a lot, clearly shows that as Giorgio concluded, if we conceptualize intelligence as cognitive processes that are linked to the functional organization of the brain, it leads to significantly high relationships with academic achievement. And these processes have direct implications for instruction and intervention. We can do better. Eligibility determination. This is the case of Rocky. A real, not, not, it's not really Rocky, but a real boy. Um, a little boy who had to suffer, unfortunately. Went to a, he actually went to school close to where I live in Northern Virginia, at a very good district with very good school psychologists. Um, first grade, he was significantly below benchmarks. He was struggling. They got him all kinds of help. Middle of the second, uh, uh, and he, he, they retained him. Bad intervention, retention. By the middle of the second year in the first grade, he was still struggling and feeling bad about himself and having trouble focusing and paying attention and so on and so forth. So after two years of special team meetings, what was happening was they were really pushing RTI and they just wanted to RTI and RTI and RTI and not test him. If they had given him the cast to brief, couple of months after he started with interventions, they would have found his weakness. And they would have found out that, wow, we need to do something more than RTI. Because he had a 76 on the successive processing and a 72 on his planning scale. With 101 and simultaneous 80, 98 on retention with academic weaknesses. This is a really, really, bad combination. Whenever you have a planning weakness and something else, because that means when you get stuck, you can't figure out what you need to do. Because planning is how you do what you do. So what are you likely to do? What's most likely to happen when a student's trying to read and it's, they're not being successful and they don't have a good plan, they get anxious, they Stop and go do something else. So you remember that that's a negative reinforcement paradigm, right? Because you reduced the anxiety by withdrawing from the situation. But when we help the student understand, yes, it's going to be hard, but we can help you do better, that'll make a difference. Now, I'm going to come back to that topic. But I want you to know that on my website, you can get these free 
achievement PASS score analyzes. For all the different achievement tests that are out there, all you have to do is you put in the four scores from the cognitive assessment system and the achievement test, whichever achievement test you use, and it'll do all the comparisons. It'll test the significance of the difference between each PASS score and all the different achievement scores, tell you if they're consistent or just significantly discrepant or not, and build the triangle that I've been talking to you about. It happens in a flash. It's all free, and it's there for all the achievement tests. I suggest you use Pfeiffer's assessments of reading, math, and writing because his three tests are very closely keyed or tied to PASS. So for example, in his reading comprehension subtest, part of what you find out is does the student use a strategy or not? So you have a student who has a low planning score and they're doing poorly in reading comprehension because they're not using a strategy. It all fits together beautifully. So if you don't use Steve's tests, that's fine, but use the other academic tasks. A little side note here. I'm really concerned because of what's happened in our world in the last eight months that a lot of achievement test norms are going to be inaccurate because the students today, I don't think they've had the benefit of the education that students would typically have. And another advantage of Steve's tests is because he does get at not only what they're doing, but how they do it. So it's something that we need to learn more about. So I just tell you that to think about it and be on the lookout for more discussions on this topic as everything evolves in the months and hopefully not the years to come in this regard. So for Rocky, what we do is we talk to him about overcoming anxiety. Um, we talk to him about using segmenting because segmenting is a way of making successive chains easier to manage, chunking for reading, decoding, and so on. These handouts are in my book. You're allowed to reproduce them. You're allowed to give them away. It's not a copyright infringement. It says right on every handout. It's for students, parents, and teachers. It, you, know, you can reproduce for educational purposes. Now, one of the... One of the handouts for, for, this, for, for this case is planning facilitation for math calculation. I've published a line of research on this methodology called planning facilitation, not planning instruction, because you don't actually teach kids to be strategic. You encourage them to understand the value of a strategy. Now, this particular study um, of Jackie Eisman's ja um, was, I want you to look at the title, Cognitive Strategy Instruction to Improve Math Calculation for Ch Children with ADHD and LD. All these students had both problems. And look, it's a randomized control study published in the Journal of Learning Disabilities. You don't get in the Journal of Learning Disabilities unless you do things well. And Jackie did, this was her dissertation. Um, so what did, it, what did we have? We had an experimental group and a control group. The experimental group got this planning facilitation method, which I'll explain to you in a moment. The control group got more math instruction. So we're comparing a cognitive intervention to additional explicit instruction in math taken from their curriculum as all these test questions that the kids did. That's how we, we tested them free post. That's what they, where they all came from. Anyway, what did we find? What did we do? The um, planning, or you could call it metacognitive strategy instruction, teaches facilitated discussions. It's like solution-focused counseling. The teachers just asked questions. What was your goal? Where did you start? What strategies did you use? What will you do next time? And the students in the whole class 
to hear each other, hear the other kids say things like, um, my goal was to do the easy problems first. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Um, I did my problems and I checked my work. Oh, okay. Um, I draw lines to keep the columns straight. That's a good way of organizing it. And I did the ones that took the least amount of time. Okay, that's efficiency. That's reasonable. But what did we find? We found that when we looked at these math worksheets taken from directly from the curriculum of that school, the kids who were encouraged, who received the experimental group improved dramatically, the normal group a little bit. The, um, the Wyatt numerical operation scores, the experimental group improved better than the normal instruction. Same thing for math fluency. A year later, we went back and we pulled the achievement test scores out of the files, the current, then current, the experimental group was still better than the comparison group. A year later, we were never in the school in that year. This simple intervention made a profound difference in these students' performance. And there's a bunch of research on this, related research on cognitive in interventions. Thank you so much uh, for your time. This was incredibly helpful and worthwhile and uh, really appreciate it. So, Thank uh, you. Take care. Take care now.